Morning, friends. Let's pray, shall we? Our great God and Father, we praise you for this new day, and we praise you for such a glorious gospel. Speak to us today through your word, we ask that we might enjoy the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus, and that we might be reformed as that light chases away the darkness of our sin, our doubt, our ignorance. And so transform us and help us to enjoy you and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. It was the evening of Friday the 18th of April, 1521, in the city of Worms, where Martin Luther, a mere monk, was brought before Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, Lord of Spain, Burgundy, Austria, southern, northern Italy, the Netherlands. Now, it had started getting dark, so the torches were lit, and it was packed and stiflingly hot in the room. Luther was told he had been summoned in order to recant his teachings, and he answered, I am bound by the scriptures I've quoted. My conscience is captive to the Word of God. Until this point, his voice had been quite low and subdued, but it began to rise, and he said, I cannot and I will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. At that point... Luther seemed to be standing against the whole world. An official immediately blasted him for his arrogance in believing that he was the only one to know the truth. And then two soldiers grabbed him and escorted him from the hall amid cries from those in the hall to the pyre with him. And the emperor declared, Luther is an obstinate, schismatic, and manifest heretic who should, therefore, be burned. Now, Luther escaped within 24 hours. But the question is, what had he discovered that made him so unflinching? in the face of being burned alive. And I want to understand that, what convictions were beginning to drive him. I want to back up a moment so you can see what Luther was brought up with. He was brought up with an understanding of justification that went back to the theologian Augustine. And Augustine had said, if you want to understand justification, you need to turn to the book of Romans. Fine. He said, you need to turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 5, where Paul says, God has poured His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit He's given us. It's a beautiful truth, but it's not justification. But as Augustine saw it, this is what happens in justification. God pours His love into our hearts internally transforming us so that I become more and more loving towards God and neighbor, more and more righteous, more and more just, if I'd. And on the basis of that internal transformation, I become more and more inherently worthy of heaven. Now, It sounded lovely when a great theologian like Augustine said it. But what do you think that does to you if you really believe that? Well, what clearly happened over the next few centuries was that Europe became a place 
increasingly terrified of sudden death and facing judgment. Because as the judges said at the trial of Joan of Arc in 1431, they said, this woman sins when she says she's certain of being received into paradise. For on this earthly journey, no pilgrim can know whether they are worthy of glory or of punishment. When John writes, I write these things so that you may know you have eternal life, the judges said, no pilgrim can know. And that judgment made complete sense within the logic of the system. If you can only enter heaven because we have, yes, by God's enabling grace, but become personally worthy of heaven, by that line of reasoning, I can have as much confidence in heaven as I have in my own sinlessness. And therefore, walking to his university back from his parents, the 21-year-old student, Martin Luther, in 1505, caught in that summer thunderstorm, the lightning bolt crashed close to him, and he was physically smashed to the ground. And as the air was expelled from his lungs, as he hit the ground, the words came out as a scream, and listen closely to what the words are. The words came out, St. Anne, help me, I'll become a monk. Terrified of sudden death, because he had no knowledge of Christ's sufficient, gracious salvation. He had no assurance of salvation. And here's the thing that is even more terrifying than that. Notice who he cried to. Martin Luther had never spoken to God in his life and wouldn't do so for another five years. He didn't dare. And so he prays to St. Anne the mother of Mary, thinking if I put in a good word with her, she'll put in a good word with Mary, who'll put in a good word with Jesus, who'll put in a good word with the Father. Poor man. Isn't this tragic religiosity? He couldn't even cry out to God because he had no assurance of how he stood with him. And he thinks entering a monastery to earn his salvation is going to help, which is what he did. He became a monk, and for the next 10 years or so, he, through his monkery, thought to climb the ladder to heaven. He'd spend up to six hours at a time confessing his sins, and given how structured his monastic life was, if you spend six hours in the confessional, that means you've missed the next service, which means you need to confess that as well. And so he got quite behind. He deliberately tried to make sure that he could sleep in freezing cold, wearing rough clothing, doing all he could by how he looked and talked and behaved to placate God by his behavior. Did he feel better after that? No, he said, though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. And I could not believe that God was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love I hated God. Because he saw if God is the sort of monstrous being who forces you to try to earn your salvation, then he's a tough, cruel employer. The sort of God that the more you try to buy him off, the further you find yourself from actually fulfilling the law and loving the Lord your God. The more you try to earn salvation, the less you can fulfill the law, he found. And he started wrestling with Romans 1.17. 
This was the verse that annoyed him, especially. Because Romans 1.17 had in it a phrase he hated. In the gospel, writes Paul, the righteousness of God is revealed. And Luther thought, okay, the righteousness of God, what is that? The righteousness of God describes how God is righteous, which is awful news for me because I'm unrighteous. So if God's righteous, that must mean He's going to judge me because I'm unrighteous. But Paul says that's good news. Now, this is the cruelty of Scripture, he said. Even the good news means I will be punished because God is righteous and I'm not. And then, hammering away at the text in his cell, he wrote, I began to understand by attention to the context that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous live by a gift of God, namely by faith. And here I felt I was altogether born again and it entered paradise itself through open gates. In that tower experience, Luther discovered a different God who relates to us in a different way, a God who loves us first before we ever love Him. He saw the righteousness of God is something that God shares with us. The righteousness of God is something He shares with the unrighteous, with failures like you and me. And He then sought to explain that to the world. But before we get into the nature of that discovery, I want us to see First of all, that Luther's first battle and the first key to reforming the church was the battle for Scripture. That what Romans and the rest of Scripture said trumped what the church was teaching. Now, <clears throat> when Luther began his protest. Luther was addressing a church in Rome, get this, that affirmed Scripture's authority and inspiration. So what's the problem? Scripture is authoritative and inspired, they said. What was it then about Luther's method that was so different and so offensive to the Roman church? Well, Luther had the audacity to say, Scripture alone is the supreme and inerrant authority. So where popes and councils can go wrong, Scripture alone does not. Scripture alone is the church's ultimate authority, sufficient for faith and practice. And so Luther said, the saints could err in their writings and the sin in their lives, but the Scriptures cannot err. And that establishes and outlines the Reformation's theological method in contrast to the Roman Catholic method, the Reformers and their heirs today hold that Scripture is our chief, supreme, and ultimate authority. And here's the thing. There would be no Reformation without that doctrine. And you can see this if we contrast Martin Luther with that belief with Erasmus of Rotterdam, the great humanist scholar 
who'd produced the, the edition of the Greek New Testament that Luther had been reading when he came to his great discovery. So Erasmus was critical, but why is Erasmus not counted as the first reformer? He was the one who made the Greek New Testament available. He provided the coals for the Reformation. Yes, he did, but Erasmus' possession of the Scriptures and his very deep study of them changed little for the man because of how he treated the Scriptures. He buried them under convenient assertions of vagueness, he gave the Scriptures or accorded them very little practical, let alone governing authority. And therefore, for Erasmus, the Bible was just one voice among many. And so it could be squeezed, tailored, adjusted to fit his own vision of what Christianity was, which was basically follow Christ. Christ is the example. And to break out of that suffocating scheme where Scripture simply did not have the authority to change him, it took Luther's attitude that Scripture is the only sure foundation for belief. The Bible had to be acknowledged as the supreme authority, allowed to contradict and overrule all other claims. Because if that didn't happen, then Scripture's message would itself be hijacked if it's not supreme. In other words, a simple reverence for the Bible, an acknowledgement that Scripture has some authority, would never have been enough to bring about the Reformation. Without sola scriptura, the church would remain trapped by its own teachings. Scripture could not be the liberating, supreme authority speaking change to the church. That was Luther's first battle. The second was over the content of Scripture and what it taught about justification. Now, when Luther came to explain his discovery, he'd been in Romans when he'd been discovering it, but actually when he first came to explain this discovery, it was through an Old Testament text he turned, the Song of Songs. But he wanted to use an illustration brought from the Song of Songs of the lover and his beloved. He used an illustration to help us understand the gospel. And the story he told went like this. There is a poor girl full of shame and debt. In fact, she was a prostitute. She could never by her behavior make herself the queen. But then, one day, the king comes out of his own love and woos her and brings her to his wedding day. And at that wedding moment, she says to him, all that I am I give to you, and all that I have I share with you. And so she shares with him all her debts. He's so wealthy, his wealth swallows them up. And he turns to her and says, my darling, all that I am I give to you, and all that I have I share with you. And with that, in that moment, that poor girl, in that moment, she is the queen. Her status has just changed. It's not that she knows the queen's English. It's not that she knows how to behave in the court well yet. She's not learned that. But by status, she is the queen. And so, said Luther, this is the great marriage swap, the joyful exchange, 
that the sinner has with Jesus Christ. Our great, great, great bridegroom takes all our sin, all our death, all our judgment upon Himself when we're united to Him in this marital union, and He drowns all that in His blood. And then He gives to us, clothes us like the King, His Queen, with all His righteousness, all His wealth, all that is His, the bridegroom shares with His bride. And so, said Luther, the sinner can confidently display her sins in the face of death and hell and say, if I've sinned, my Christ who is mine has not sinned. And all mine is now His, all my sin. And all His, His righteousness is now mine. And so, the, the believing sinner, the Christian like that poor girl who is at the same time a queen by status but not queenly by nature, so the Christian is at the same time a sinner still in themselves but righteous by status. And this is a doctrine that is so much stronger than mere forgiveness, so much richer. We give that simple illustration, what is justification? It's just as if I'd never sinned, which is half true. And that's what I thought justification was when I was a young believer. And I thought what happened was Christ gives me a blank slate. I'm a sinner, He forgives me, but then I sin again pretty quickly. So is it then that I go in and out of His favor and I, I, I dirty myself up again with sin and I need to be re-justified? What I hadn't grasped is that joyful exchange that not only do I give Christ my sin, He gives to me all His righteousness. Now, justification is a legal term. It fits into the idea that man stands before God the judge in a cosmic courtroom. And this is how we use the word justify, isn't it? It's not a word we use very often, but let's, let's imagine. Let's say at the coffee break later, one of you, you know who you are, causes a scene. And we're going to assume there's a good reason for this, but it doesn't look like it. And so after you've caused the scene, I come up to you and say, could you justify what you just did there? What am I asking you to do? I'm not asking you to go back and improve your behavior, am I? I'm asking you to give an assessment of your behavior. For that is what to justify means. Justification is an assessment, a verdict, a pronouncement. Just as the bridegroom says those words of promise to his bride, and by those words her status changes, this is what justification is. We are justified when God announces the verdict that we have a righteous status before Him. And therefore, in the Bible, the righteous person is not the person who has no sin. The righteous person is not the one who's done plenty of good works. The righteous person is the sinner on whom God has pronounced the verdict righteous. And would you turn with me to Romans chapter 4 to see this?
Here are the sort of words no human would imagine writing. Left to their own devices, Paul writes, Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, well, then he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works... His wages aren't counted as a gift. If you work, they're, they're his due. And here's the verse. <laughs> that is, you need to see it in black and white in Scripture. It's so incredible to read. To the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted as righteousness. It's that incredible language. To the one who does not work, but believes in the one who not justifies the one who sorts themselves out, not justifies the one who's been through some process of internal transformation. No, God who justifies the wicked. This is our God, and this person's faith is counted as righteousness. Verse 6, just as David, also speaking of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works, and he quotes Psalm 32, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Yes, we look at ourselves, believers, every day and know there is so much sin inside me, but blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. So the blessed person is not the person who has no sin. The blessed person is the one whose sins are not counted against them. It's legal language. It means, to use Luther's shocking phrase, believers are simul justus et peccator, simultaneously just, righteous with the righteousness of Christ and sinners in themselves. And you know, there is no support for the use of the word justification as a process. That misunderstanding arose because of a bad translation of the Greek New Testament into the Latin that the Roman church was relying on. Because there is a perfectly good set of words that the New Testament could have used if it wanted to speak of making us righteous inherently rather than God declaring us righteous when we're not in ourselves. And this truth, the fact that justification does not mean an internal change, is now being acknowledged by many Roman Catholic scholars. Luther's jaw would have been on the floor. Listen to this. In the Catholic magazine, This Rock, um, that refers to Christ. Um, not to Christ, the rock is not Christ, but Peter. Uh, Leslie Rumble writes, Now it is quite true that Paul made use of a word which in the Greek language had the technical meaning of legal acquittal. And if the word can have no other meaning than that, one would scarcely dispute the interpretation of justification as implying no more than to be counted as righteous or not guilty in the sight of God. But alas, Luther had not the advantages of modern scholarship. Ah, modern scholarship. <laughs> It'll get you where you want to go. <laughs> Luther belonged to an age, writes Rumble, 
when it was thought that the real meaning of the New Testament could be best ascertained by discovering the exact sense of the Greek language in which the books were originally written. Oh, Luther. <laughs> but while acknowledging that the meaning of the words of the New Testament support Luther's understanding, Rumble rejects this, saying, no, the whole religious outlook takes precedence over the fine print. So religion goes with them, even if the words of the Bible don't. See again how sola scriptura needs to be driving change. Now, one of the main charges that was thrown against this understanding of justification by faith alone was this. The Reformers were asked, look, if you say that people are saved, justified by God's grace alone, by faith alone, why all these calls to holy living in Scripture? Why are believers going to bother with holy living? If they know they're going to walk into heaven, Christians are going to say, let us continue in sin that grace may abound. I like sinning. God likes forgiving. We're all happy. And that was what many Roman Catholics wondered when they heard the Reformer's message. And that criticism works if the gospel I preach is have free heaven by this thing called grace. And it's all free. And if I preach a message that says, look, you can have heaven for free, just say yes. And everyone's thinking, well, I don't want hell for me, I want heaven for me, so I'll tick the yes, please, heaven box, because I want good things for me. The mess goes away if the gospel I preach is, I have no life to offer you but Christ alone. And I preach Christ. Because you cannot separate justification and Christian living. You can't abstract these things from the person of Christ. You can't pull apart justification and sanctification because God doesn't have such a thing as justification or righteousness that He can throw out from heaven. Here, have a bit of eternal life. Have some righteousness. There is no such thing. Rather, God the Father has His Son, Jesus Christ, and He gives us Christ. And in Him, we have the righteousness of that perfect bridegroom. And when we are in Him, we will be filled with His Spirit who will transform us into His image. He gives us His Son, Jesus Christ. That is the only gospel we must preach. I do not offer abstract eternal life, abstract have heaven for free. I offer Jesus Christ. In Him, the righteousness of God. In Him, eternal life. And walking in His ways walking with Him, you will know freedom and joy and life. But walk away from Him and you will not know those things. And that means the charge that we will just carry on sinning simply doesn't work if preachers offer Christ. I offer no life apart from Him, for there is none to be had. And Martin Luther put it perfectly. He said, through faith in Christ, Christ's righteousness becomes our righteousness. All that He has becomes ours, or rather, He Himself becomes ours. For that's what the bride gets from her bridegroom. She gets Him. He's the reward. Justification was the matter of the Reformation. Through justification by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ, 
God was glorified as utterly merciful and good, as supremely holy and compassionate. And therefore, people began to see, here's a God in whom I can find comfort and delight. Here is not one who simply approves those who've sorted themselves out. And so, the glory of God, given who this God is, became the root of true satisfaction and joy for believers because they'd seen God revealed for who He is in the gospel. And the glory of God then became their guiding light and their ultimate goal. Here's how Luther, remember the man who once said he hated God, this is how he come to speak of God in His glory and love. He said, the love of God does not find, it creates that which is pleasing to it. The love of God loves sinners, evil persons, fools, weaklings, and rather than seeking its own good, the love of God flows forth and bestows good, and therefore sinners are attractive because they are loved. They're not loved because they try to make themselves attractive. Does this matter today? This doctrine of justification? Friends, you will never love God. Our churches will not be filled with believers who lean into the Christian life without this, because you will never love God unless you know He loves you first. You will never enjoy Him unless you know you have a security to enjoy Him in. And therefore, justification by faith alone, dear brothers and sisters, is the foundation stone of healthy Christian living. Of healthy Christian living. See, isn't it the case you can be in a conference like this and you can feel there's a sweet gospel for the person next to me who seems quite sorted. But if you knew the depths of my own depravity and dirtiness, you'd understand God must be for them, but he, this gospel cannot reach to me. And if you know any of that, here's Luther's advice to a friend who is struggling with assurance. Luther wrote, when the devil throws up your sins to you and declares you deserve death and hell, we ought to speak like this. Devil, I admit I deserve death and hell. What of it? Does this mean I shall be sentenced to eternal damnation? By no means, for I know one who suffered and made satisfaction in my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and where he is, there I shall be also. For no sin is greater than the blood of this Lamb and we are clothed in Him. Justification by faith alone means that we who are aware that we are a sea of failures, we can approach a most holy God with absolute honesty about who we are. And at the same time, we can approach Him with absolute boldness because of Christ and not our own performance. To approach God with honesty and boldness, nothing else can give you that. And how about the world? I often hear people say, is this not a message that simply doesn't work today because people don't feel guilty anymore, right? Everyone thinks they're good inside. I'm not guilty. I'm not a bad person. Therefore, I have no need for forgiveness. 
So is this a gospel that simply doesn't apply to our culture anymore? Far from it. It is deep in our blood today, as you see in every advertisement, that the more attractive we make ourselves, the more we'll be loved. And what Luther found to his delight was, with God it is the other way round. Where, yes, all the world says, make yourself more successful, more attractive, better, and then you'll be more loved and accepted. No, God does not love people because they've sorted themselves out. He loves sinners, failures, and that love makes them flourish. As Luther put it, sinners are attractive because they are loved. They're not loved because they make themselves attractive. This is still a gospel that our world desperately needs. Let's pray with boldness now. Father, we praise you for this gospel. We thank you that you should be so merciful to clothe us who are so consistently sinful with the very righteousness of your beautiful Son. And we pray, would you give us a clarity on these truths and press into them. And may we see the light of the gospel of the glory of Jesus scattering the darkness again. In Jesus' strong name we pray it. Amen.